and welcome back. I am so excited that you did not turn away because we have the most amazing women that we are highlighting this week. And I'm so excited that they have taken some time out to share their stories of impact and philanthropy and what they're working on and what makes them so special. And with us today is Phyllis Amen, and she is no different. And I'm so excited to hear a little bit about your story and your journey and what you're going to be speaking about at the upcoming TEDx event. So how are you today? I'm doing great, Rhonda. Thanks so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here with you um, and thrilled that I'm going to be doing this presentation at this TEDx event. It actually was on my bucket list for about three years. And so, you know, things come together at the right time for the right reason. And, and through that, I've met you. So it's all good. I love it. You know, and it's so funny that you use the the words right time for the right reasons and the right purpose cuz so many times especially as we're as we're growing as people sometimes we get angry, right? Like why not me? Why not me? But I feel like when the opportunity presents itself, it really is about the timing and potentially maybe you weren't ready. So tell us right and like people get angry, right? They like call it for what it is. I have met so many people that why not me? Why did this not happen to me? I, I'm better than this person. And mm. especially where it comes to these speaking engagements, ones as popular as TEDx, you know, it's on everybody's bucket list. But the why not me syndrome, I'm glad that it brought us together because I'm sure there's a lot of people that are still waiting in line for their opportunity. And we'll just say to those people, your timing's not right. It correct. was not your opportunity. Don't so, give up. It's you're just so not your time. Correct. You're so correct because I have said that very thing to people that even though it was on my list, probably it wasn't the right time for me because in these couple of years that I've wanted to do it, I think I've honed my message and understood my direction better and will therefore have a better presentation than I would have had three years ago. Yeah, and we go through that all the time too. And, and I'm I'm a victim of that mentality. There are sometimes things that I want. And as much as we try to spearhead and fast track, sometimes it's about process. And it's about being with the right company at the right time. And by company, I don't mean business, just the people that we are spending our time with. And I think that has a lot to do with who we are and how we grow, you know, as humans in general. So you did send me some information about what you're going to be talking about. And I am so excited for you to share a little bit of your message with our audience today. Well, thanks. So um, let me give a little bit of the backstory yes. of how I came to this message. So I'm a speech and language pathologist and dementia care specialist by profession. And I've worked over 40,000 hours in long-term care environments. And through that process, I came to realize that we really are not I'll say doing right by older people in, in our society, especially in America, right? And as an American culture, whatever, whatever that is. And as a result of that, I became very impassioned and outspoken and vocal and became an advocate about why and how we should do better for older people. As a matter of fact, my last book that I wrote on my own was called Dignity and Respect are aging parents getting what they deserve. And as, so as a result of that, I've formulated ideas about how can we move the needle in society so that we treat older people in a better way? And what can I provide to people so that they can age more healthfully and gracefully? So that's really the crux of my message how we can move that needle. And I have a concept about starting with children and that really it's an active process that lives inside of us to become an older person. And if we can understand that and respect that, then, then 
maybe we'll look forward to becoming that person rather than looking at older people and say, oh my God, that's an old person kind of thing. And, and I love that. You know, unfortunately, both of my parents were taken at an earlier age. So one of the things when we're speaking about, you know, people aging, I've missed the opportunity of the storytelling. And my children have lost that opportunity of listening to, you know, to what their lives were like and their childhood. And I think that as a society, we're so busy in our day-to-day -day operations. And unfortunately, I think that a lot of our youth have lost respect along the way. Um, they've also lost in my, I can say this, I have five kids, so I can say this <laughs> without somebody yelling. You know, I think what happens too is they've lost the ability to socialize and ask questions and interact. So when you have this aging population, you have history right at your fingertips and you have so many amazing and inspiring stories that we really take for granted, you know, every single day. Yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. And, you know, you can hit a button and get information in any search engine, but it's different from somebody who has lived that experience and who could share what that experience felt like. Uh, rather than just reading something on a page. Um, so, you know, in that process, I've, um, you know, from, from a, how did I develop that into, you know, some kind of business is to really help people um, make better care decisions for older parents or loved ones, but also for themselves so that they can age in a more healthful way. And they, hopefully will not find themselves in one of these long-term care environments where we're not providing the best care because people who have lived their life and served their families and their countries and their communities and their, their profession, you know, de deserve to continue in life, continue on what I say, their life's journey in the best way they possibly can. And there's so much they can continue to offer. So that's part of it. The other part of it is, so I'm sure your listeners, and, and maybe you even know, um, you, you know, about the sandwich generation, right? So <laughs> sandwich generation are people yeah. who are caught between, you know, family responsibilities, job responsibilities, and caring for an older parent or loved one, if, if that situation still exists for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it turns out that 70% of the sandwich generation is now between the ages of 40 and 59, which are prime work years. So if businesses, employers are not in touch with the issues that their workforce is dealing with, they're, they're losing out on maximizing people's ability to be productive in their in their job right because they're so distracted and pulled in so many different directions so i encourage businesses to in, invest in the well-being of their workforce and address these issues so that people will be more invested in their employer because their employer is invested in them and understands what they're going through in their lives you know and i love that because it makes it also a little bit more i don't want to use the word spiritual but when you have somebody that cares about the process that you're going through at any point in time it does make you more committed to wanting to give back and give back stronger and harder the problem that i see um, is that there are so many small businesses that may not have the resources or be able to support the time away for some of these employees. So what recommendations would you make in a situation like that? So that's a, uh, that's a great question. Um, because yeah, people, you know, they, they do things, they, they come in late, they take days off, they want to work part time, there are so many things like that. But there are small changes, or you know, that they can make within the work day, even giving people you know, a few moments here or there to clear their head, to do some deep breathing, to, um, um, yeah, I'll give you an example from my own daughter. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she works for a small company and, um, 
it's actually a, a good concept where they're coming from. You know, they pay for everyone to eat lunch uh, in the office so they could remain at their desk and be productive and, and all of that, right? She is dealing with her father, we're divorced now, who does have some medical issues. And um, I have asked her, you know, how is that like for her? And she says, well, you know, she's like changed chained to this desk. And it would be a wonderful thing if her employer understood that even, you know, 15 minutes in the in mid morning and mid afternoon, if she could even just walk around, stretch her legs, um, even if they had some kind of chair yoga thing for 15 minutes, it yeah. rejuvenates a person, it re-energizes them. And then they have more energy and focus for you know, what they have to do for their job or give someone 15 minutes to make some personal phone calls rather than that person trying to fit it in and sneak it in and, you know, yeah. you know, when they or or multitask and be on the phone making that appointment while they're doing something for their job. If, if the employer just understood that they I think they find that the people who in their employ are more productive Instead, I think they have this mindset that it's taking away from the productivity, but it's actually adding to it. Well, I love that. And I appreciate you so much taking time with us today. I'm going to look forward to having you back as another guest in the future. Uh, but for today, that's all we have time-wise. So once again, we are speaking with Phyllis Amen, and I am looking forward to seeing her live in just a few weeks at the upcoming TEDx event. Until next time, stay tuned. We're getting ready to bring you another guest.